Um, good evening, everyone. This is the last presentation of the last day of the PUSIC course, um, with a very difficult title, Security by Design. I did not choose this title. Uh, Bart thought it was a cool idea to talk about this. Oh, do I need to put it on? Oh, okay. Deal, yeah. Sure. And um, as you know, Bart always says, oh, that's easy, right? Uh, it uh, only takes 15 minutes huh, to finish. So I try to collect things from what we saw this week. And actually, security by design, in my opinion, is still largely an open research uh, problem. Certainly, if you want to include this in hardware design. And so I will mostly focus on really on hardware design backend. I know there's a lot of crypto guys here, maybe software people here. So I'll give basics on uh, hardware design. Um, this lecture. So well, this was my first thing. Uh, security by design is not the same as design for security, um, which I thought was kind of my original idea. And I want to focus on hardware design for cryptographers. So you get the security application, a set of constraints. And the security application is, of, of course, more than just implementing a crypto algorithm. This is part of it. And the output will be some hardware for IoT, for the cloud, uh, maybe an IP module, something like that. And the way to go, in my opinion, to get security by design is to map the security problem on what we call the design pyramid. And I will show that. And I'll give you a few examples. We're not there, um, but we can link to, to, um, link to topics or research topics which are happening in the hardware group. Um, I think this we saw already. I think um, probably Josep and Benedict copied some of my old slides on the, differen the difference of design for efficiency or design for efficiency and security. Um, and what will it be in the future? Uh, probably immersed. But let me start with simple definition, the definition of what we want. We want actually, we want trust in what we design. The end, the end um, topic will be um, some, some components, some hardware component that we trust, right? Um, and what is trust? Trust, as I've taken it from the um, security engineering book of Ross Anderson, who himself have it, has it after some definition of NSA, a trusted system or component is one whose failure can break the security policy, while a trustworthy system or component is one that won't fail but you have to rely on it. It's kind of relies on a root of trust. The trusted computing group defines it as an entity can be trusted if it always behaves in the expected manner for the intended purposes. Uh, so loosely stated, um, if a trusted system or component fails, then bad things can happen. And so what we try to do in hardware is actually minimize what needs to be trusted. And so often it boils down, what's your roots of trust? Um, the roots of trust for the protocol designer, they assume that the algorithm they rely upon, that's their root of trust. The algorithm designers, they rely on the fact that the key is going to be secure. And the algorithm designers also assume that this implementation will be this secure. The software designers rely on the fact that the hardware platform is secure. And the hardware people, they rely maybe on the random numbers and, uh, and the paths, but they're at the bottom, right? So there's not much lower to go there. Um, and so I'll give kind of this design pyramid will come back in my presentation. And that's kind of how I think the way to go to do security by design. So this is a slight repetition of what you've seen. <laughs> in the old days, if we wanted to do um, secure design, we actually were only worried about attacks or the attacker model being on the channel between two communicating parties. So on the left, you have a PC. The right, you have some kind of server room. And we, took an, we were taking, or we will take some encryption, cryptographic operations. They're sitting in black boxes. And you get strong mathematical algorithms and protocols. And the challenge was to get them working. The challenge was to get them working in, in hardware. And we assume kind of this thing being the root of trust. So the focus in these applications is really on efficiency. Get it working. Um, 
And this model, you would say, well, maybe it still applies to cloud setting uh, because you don't have access, it's far away. But I think even there it might not apply anymore. Think about the micro-architectural side channel attacks. You might have seen some of them uh, also this week. Um, so in the current model, we actually assume um, a gray box model. It's also a little bit of a simplified view where you have attacks both on channels and endpoints. So attacks happen on data which is in transmission or data which is being processed. Um, so encryption, cryptographic operations now sits in gray boxes. We still need these strong mathematical algorithms and protocols, which most of COSIC will provide us, but we now also need secure implementations. And you have seen some examples already today. Now we want to so to combine both. So we need efficiency and security. Um, and what do we want to protect? Basically, anything that starts with an E or starts with smart will probably need sec uh, security. And that's anything you have seen this week. <coughs> now for the hardware guys, um, what kind of crypto algorithms do we get? We get them, um, we, we want implementations for terabits, long lasting security sitting in the cloud, in the servers, whatever. We get typical requirements, megabit security. That's kind of the inner circle. <coughs> I think that should be the pointer, no? Is that the pointer? Is this bot top button, right? I think so. Ah, it's off. Sorry, sorry. So the middle round. Up to crypto for all the tiny IoT devices. And that goes for uh, stickers with some um, <coughs> RF. That could be medical implants. This is kind of brain um, implants uh, to all kinds of gadgets that will need uh, security. That's probably lightweight, hardware entangled security. Maybe we can not add uh, too, too, um, too much of security to, to those, right? So we need both, we need efficient, lightweight implementations. We need workers on efficiency, um, which are in the power, the area timing budgets and public key, even if it's only 1024 bits RSA on an 8-bit microcontroller in a budget of 100 microwatt is really tough. Um, trustworthy implementations, and then comes then uh, what's my attacker model. They need to be resistant to attacks. You have seen many of them today. You've seen the active attacks, you've seen the importance of the JTAG, uh, which Leonard just explained. Passive attacks, which you've also seen today, which uh, Benedict and Josep explained. But we want, also, so we want to show that the device is trustworthy. Um, so the first thing, what I want to show you, and this is more now a little bit of slides for, for the non-hardware designers, what is efficiency? How do we measure efficiency? What are the constraints that we get? Um, and for embedded security, that's area, time, power, energy, and then physical security. How much physical security or security do, protection do you want? Area is a little bit is easy in the sense that it's easy to measure. Uh, for an ASIC, um, or an ASIC, which is actually an application-specific integrated circuit, that's a piece of hardware dedicated to a specific purpose, we count the number of gates. And a gate, uh, the unit of gates is a NAND gate, and that consists of four transistors. Um, for FPGAs, which are field programmable gate arrays, this is already a pre baked circuit, which you have to download your own uh, technology. The units will be LUTs, which are lookup tables and flip-flops. If we go to embedded microcontrollers, area is measured by the memory size, program size, data size. And many of those embedded devices, there is no such thing as external memory. You don't have disk, so it all has to fit on this little thingy. Um, oops. But an important one, and that's because I'm including it here, as a feedback to crypto designers is the concept of time. Uh, clock frequency, sample frequency, throughput requirements, latency requirements, those are important requirements for crypto designers and real-time applications. Um, 
real time is measured either by throughput or by latency. And it's given, it's, it's given by the application. So it's nothing to do with the hardware or the clock frequency. <coughs> for instance, it's the amount of data needs to be processed per time. For video, this is going to be gigabits per second. For internet, it could be gigapackets per second. And so the constraint you often get is a real-time sample rate. And the hardware you're designing has to work as fast as the application dictates. If you go faster, your hardware is going to be idle. If you're slower, you have a problem. You have to drop package. Latency is also associated with the application. It's also something which is given to you from, by the application. And it's typically the delay, the round trip delay from input to output. So it's a measure of reaction speed or turnaround time. So video is throughput, but if you do a conference call and someone is on the other end, you can have high speed video, but you also want to turn around time, right? So there cannot be delay on it. That's latency. Um, so this is important, for instance, for if you have brakes on the car, you have a sensor that gives you some alarm. What's the turnaround time before you react, right? So you cannot send the data to the cloud and back to figure out what to do with the sensor, with the information that comes from the sensor. So that's latency. Um, memory encryption, typically like that, is also a little bit like that because you want data back within, say, a clock cycle or two clock cycles. High throughput and low latency don't go together often. It's very tough to combine them in one design. So maybe as a professor, I can ask a question. It's exam period. Why not? Anybody knows? Yeah. Exactly. So the way we obtain high throughput is that we start pipelining our design. So, but when you pipeline our design, we actually introduce a clock and we make sure that the pipeline or the calculations can follow the throughput. But then you actually introduce pipeline delays. And so if you want latency, you actually often have very short computation time. And so those two, because typically high throughput being done with uh, pipeline. Um, and so clock frequency is often not a system requirement. It's a requirement, it's a property of the hardware. It's something that you as a hardware designer can choose. Um, it's defined as one over the longest path or one over the critical path. And in most designs, we will apply what's called time multiplexing. And I'll give some examples of that. Which means that the clock frequency is not going to be the same as the sample frequency. And so if the clock frequency usually is higher than the sample frequency, and then the ratio of the two will tell you how many clock cycles you have available to finish the job. Um, is this for video rates or extremely high data rates? Then clock and sample might be very close, and you don't have much time to finish your task. But in many small sensor applications, things like that, you probably have quite some cycles and you start to use what's called time multiplexing. You reuse your hardware because you, want to, you don't want to lose or use the hardware for only one operation. Um, for real time, often general purpose computing is, is tough. And the reason being that caches don't have a predictable time execution. Um, so latency, sample frequency put hard constraints. And clock frequency is something that you get, right? Um, another point that I want to make for the crypto designers is that power and energy are not the same. You can optimize for power and maybe have high energy or the other way around. Power is something instantaneously, is current, multiplied by voltage, is expressed in watts, um, and you typically Check power if you have cooling problems or peak performance problems. Peak performance problems is, for instance, the case in passive RFID tags or things that scavenge their, their power from the environment. While energy is power over time, time's execution, integration of power, so it's expressed in joules. 
So typically batteries are expressed in joules. And if you know about the joules, you can say, okay, I have, I can do some and many bits encryption per unit joule. And just to show this visually, you can have a low power processor, but if it takes a long time to finish, your energy to finish the job will be much higher than maybe a slightly higher power processor, but it finishes quickly, then this is going to be a lower energy solution. And so that's what you see sometimes is that processors, they, they do calculations and then they go in idle mode. And the idle mode is really to reduce uh, the power consumptions. Um, just as an illustration, why do we check power? Because power is necessary for cooling. This is an old slide which I still use in class, and it shows the power density of Intel processors over the over decades, actually. And it used to be that over several generations of processors, that these um, that you would stay bet below uh, 10 watts per square centimeter. But then around the year 2000, almost 20 years ago, they started to realize that their power density was going up. And they were thinking, hmm, we have an issue. If the power density goes up like this, well, this is kind of the size of a hot plate. You can burn your fingers on these Pentium processors. You go up, it goes actually 100 or 1,000 becomes a nuclear reactor or a rocket nozzle power density. Now, these days you buy, and so starting here somewhere, you actually have to start introduce water cooling. So there's the power density. Now, Intel addressed that problem. You still don't have power cooling on your Intel processors. What, what, what was, how did they solve this? Multicore. Multicore, exactly. If you would, if you would put, so they pay a price, they add area, but they no longer increase their clock frequency. The clock frequency at that time was one gigahertz, two gigahertz. Right now, processors run close to three gigahertz, not much more than that. Clock frequency has flattened out. And the clock frequency has flattened out only because of power issues. That's the only reason. And so they went multi-core. And software people don't like it because it's tough to program. But that's the reason they went there. So. That's a cooling problem. Cooling is also an issue for medical implants. And the reason is when you implant something, then when you do calculations, it creates heat and it's very tough to, you cannot put a fan or something like there to cool your electronics, right? Um, so you can have maximum one degree Celsius increase in temperature before it becomes uncomfortable. And moreover, if this person has hair, that is a really nice insulation, right? So, um, um, that's a cooling problem. So you have to take that into account. Uh, yeah, some people have a less of a, of, as an issue. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, the other one is that for energy, and so cooling is also an issue here, right? So cloud, you can imagine which server uh, room this is, uh, looking at the colors for a cooling infrastructure. Um, the same actually because uh, why all these bit mining farmer, farming installations are going to New, um, Iceland or Mongolia or whatever, it's pure for cooling reasons. Um, on the other hand, energy is important for um, devices that operate on batteries. And this is a pacemaker. Pacemakers have non-rechargeable batteries. So if the battery is dead, you have to go back to the hospital and they'll give you a new pacemaker. I mean, they schedule that, of course. Uh, you don't have to wait for it to die. Um, <laughs> and so if we want to add crypto, because these things are now programmable, if we want to add crypto, they'll tell us how much energy we can spend on the crypto, right? So cooling is less of an issue. This is how much energy you can spend. Um, and that's why, say, public key might be tough on this thing. So 
for security, I mean, for designing these things and adding crypto, we have many, uh, we can usually get well-defined constraints in area, time, power, energy, and so on. The first question we usually have, or we ask back, is that, yes, you want this thing to be secure, but how do you specify that, right? Does it have to be resistant only to side channel attacks, which is passive, or also active attacks, or do you give it to someone like Nenert, then everything is broken, right? Um, so you have to trade off these things. Huh? And so how to start as a hardware designer? Um, and this is kind of my solution is what I call the security by design is by mapping this on what we call the design pyramid. Um, a design pyramid typically looks at an application. Maybe this is a car, cyber physical system. It's talking to some base station. The thing has to do some application in IoT, in smart grid, in car to car, whatever. We've seen this week um, a protocols papers, Nigel, Rule Peters, and others have talked about protocols on how to do these things. Um, they rely on set of algorithms that have to be secure. Um, which we also have seen many versions this week. These people rely on the fact that the soft if it runs in software, that the software is secure. We have seen some software security uh, presentations this week. They rely on hardware that is secure, and we've seen arithmetic papers. Um, I had put Nalen on the side because FPGA security was not covered this week. Um, we have gate level masking circuits and at the bottom we have random numbers and, and, and puffs. So, but if you are a hardware designer, you have to implement something, which of those do you take into account? Because as, as was also mentioned in, in Lauren's presentation, security is as strong as the weakest link. If I forget one of those, my, my system is broken. And that's very different than, for instance, design for low power. We can do low power algorithms, we can do low power architecture, we can do low power arithmetic, low power implement circuits. But if we forget one, we're going to be less low power, but we're still being low power, right? To some degree. And that's different here. Oh, yeah, I forgot all the side channel security people. I didn't know where to put them, so I put them <laughs> on the other, the other direction. All right. Um, they're everywhere. Um, so, because it covers so many levels here, I wanted to go with you through some of these um, design tools. What do we have available to do hardware design? And then show a little bit of, of, of attempts on, on how to add security to those tools and how, often how those tools fight security, right? So that's why I call it what, what is hardware design. Uh, from specs to tape out. So this is how I, and those that have followed my class should recognize this picture. Um, this is how hardware design is done. So hardware design is a vertical refinement over different digital abstraction levels. And we go from system specs all the way to implementation. We subdivide the job in what's called abstraction levels. We call um, system level, so some paper requirements, maybe uh, um, a C or C++ description. And then the first step we do is actually we define an architecture. We define maybe what stays in hardware, what goes in software, maybe what's going to be the analog building blocks, and so on. So you can have a microprocessor, microcontroller, DSPs, memories, coprocessor. This is kind of a top-level architecture of a system on chip. Then the next thing is that each of these modules are actually described at what's called register transfer level. This is the very log VHDL level. So you get the processor, coprocessor. Um, if you decide that your crypto algorithm is going to run in software, then maybe you have to have a description of your DSP or your microcontroller. If you want to add maybe special instructions. Or if it's a dedicated coprocessor, you have to decide on how that's going to be implemented in hardware. Um, the register transfer level is, trans is, is translated in logic level. Logic level, and this is where the synthesis tools come in place, and I'll give you some examples. And then at the, and one level down is actually really the transistor level, 
And at the transistor level, we talk about voltages, currents, differential equations, spice, things like that. And then we make a, a tape out. And the tape out is the, the last thing uh, of this thing. And that's called polygon level. And the layout is the thing that goes to fabrication, um, maybe even overseas. Originally overseas. So the idea is, if we want security by design, with all the names on it, we actually have, oops, this thing now has animation, oops. Then uh, what we have to do is actually map all the jobs we had <coughs> on the left-hand side to abstraction layers on the other side. And, if then, and for many of those, tools exist. They've never been built for security. But what we should do is actually check what of the tasks we're doing here can be mapped to the, um, to the design abstraction layers. So that would be actually the end of my presentation. Eh? So I have solved the problem <coughs> of this, uh, security by design. The, the problem is that this is far from realized, right? <coughs> so all these tools we have to do hardware design, they're optimized for performance. They're perf uh, efficiency. You can tell the tools design me for low power or you can tell the tools I would want to have high throughput out of it. But there is no button to tell them I want a high secure solution. Um, and often optimizations we add for security are kind of removed again uh, by the tool. Uh, the simplest example is, is we at any of levels of abstraction, actually our software is the same, you want constant time descriptions because constant time avoid timing attacks. Now, if you do constant time at register transfer level, the synthesis tools actually are going to realize that you have dummy instructions there. They're going to actually synthesize it away. I mean, all those here that have done some of that will realize, uh, remember that or have <coughs> um, seen that. So this is, uh, in my opinion, huge research challenge. Security as a design goal into those tools. And what I'm going to do now is just show a few examples. Um, so how we go through these design tools. Typically, this is done uh, what is called uh, the design principle or method is that it follow, follows what's called a Y chart. And this is the Y chart of Gaisky Kuhn. This is uh, how hardware design is done. And hardware typically or your design has three representations. You can describe the behavior of a hardware component or a system architecture logic level. The structure is how you implement something and physically is how it's actually realized. And you make a design, you typically start at specifications, high level, behavioral level. Maybe you simulate them, maybe you put them in, in MATLAB or in, in Magma or any of these high level tools that's far away from your actual implementation, but it gives you a golden reference. And then you have to think what is going to be structure and that's going to be a lower abstraction layer. And then maybe that lower abstraction is de decomposed in logic, maybe even to transistor levels, and then you have a composition back together. Sounds very abstract maybe, but I'll give you a simple example. <coughs> I have a behavioral level description, some kind of pseudocode, X will be assigned A when select is 1, else is B. So how do I decompose that? I make a composition in, in structural level. Structural level means that I'm going to have a few gates to realize this behavioral level statement. And this statement is maybe part of a larger thing, and I can simulate that, and so on and so forth. So I have here um, an... Um, and or invert gate and the and or invert gate can be can be used to implement like a multiplexer which is the select here select goes to both ends so i can do this with probably three gates and then if i have three gates the tools will give me a layout for these three gates and i'm not going to explain but you see the inputs a select b and so on right the x at the output um, and that's um, this level, uh, so the logic level, when you, when you kind of have start from these descriptions to this translation, 
logic or register transfer level, this is the level where you, as a designer, insert a clock or decide what's going to be the clock. But above that, it's typically kind of behavioral level synthesis. There's no clock yet. And a clock means that you have description from register to flip-flop, uh, flip-flops to operations to flip-flops. So this part is called combinatorial logic, which was also covered in Lauren's uh, presentation. And so that's what you introduced the clock. And the clock is related, um, as I said, to the sample frequency, and we could implement and we could realize some time multiplexing. So I have one piece of code here, which I can simulate, but I could have easily from this one piece of code two hardware implementations. Any idea which ones? Or how would you do this? I want the slow and I want the fast version. It's only two lines of code. Anybody else than Lauren? <laughs> Excuse me? One if or two ifs, yes. And how do you implement an if? So you're going to get, or maybe Lauren can see it. Yes, so you can either have each statement and that's, so if this would be software, you would execute one statement after the other. In hardware, you have two statements and these two statements are going to be two multiplexers, right? One for the top statement, which will generate X and one for the bottom statement, which will generate Y. So I have two hardware operators and I can execute this in one clock cycle. So every clock cycle, I can get a new set of A, B, C's and D's for four inputs. Every clock cycle, I generate two outputs. I can have a second implementation where I only have one selector, one multiplexer, but I toggle. One clock cycle, I'm using this piece of hardware to generate X. The next clock cycle, I'm going to use this piece of hardware to generate Y. See the difference? That's, this is called a time multiplexed implementation. And you do that when the clock frequency is higher than the sample frequency. For things that if you want something compact, your clock is much higher than the, the speed that your samples arrive, you're going to do time multiplexing. So, and that means that you're going to have some finite state machine, which is going to toggle between those two statements. And um, you can find tools these days that take some high level C type of description and will generate hardware for you. But the tool, you really have to tell the two what implementation you want. A two multiplexed version or a one multiplexed version. If you give this statement, to a high level synthesis tool, you actually have to tell it how fast you want it. And it might come up with one of those, depending on which the knobs are you're setting to the tool. So this is time multiplexing. You push time multiplexing to extreme, what you end up is with a processor, a single core processor and a sequential execution of all your core. But if you do everything in hardware, this is, could be a statement like this. And so that's what these tools do for you. At the register transfer level, they're actually going to do three tasks. So you give it a piece of hardware, and it's going to do three things. It's going to do scheduling, allocation, and assignment. Um, so you have a typical, and then you give it a sample frequency or a constraint, or you say this has to be as fast as possible or as compact as possible. The tools will give you different implementation results. Um, let's illustrate this with a very simple example. This is a, a function that takes a um, couple of inputs, u1, u2, and then input x, 
and some, maybe some coefficients, does multiplications, additions, and generates the output y. This is, this is called the data dependency graph. That's not important, but that's typically what you derive from your initial specs. The first thing that a tool might do is decide how many clock cycles do I have available to finish this task? So I have, uh, have to do all these multiplications. Uh, I have four multiplications and four additions that I need to execute. If I have only a software core, it's going to be easy. Those four multiplications are going to be on one multiplier because that's the only thing I have is the multiply cumulate unit or the ALU of your processor. But in hardware, I can choose. I can choose to go for four multipliers, or I can choose to have one multiplier, and it's going to take much longer to implement. And th that's what the tools will do for you. I mean, I, for small examples like this, you can do it by yourself. But if this goes by the millions of gates, then the tools will do this for you. It's called synthesis. So. And the first thing the tool will do is you give it a constraint and I say I want this, uh, this little uh, crypto algorithm to finish in three clock cycles. It's actually going to try to figure out which are the best clock cycles to put my multiplications and additions, taking the data dependencies into account. Um, if the multiplications, so you have three clock cycles, if I do two multiplications in the first clock cycles and two in the second clock cycle, I can obtain a hardware implementation with only two multipliers. I don't need four. If I would put all four multiplications in the first clock cycle, I need four multipliers. They're used in the first clock cycle, but then in clock cycle two and clock cycle three, they're idle. They're not going to be used. So the tool will doesn't like that because they want to minimize the area for the given constraint. So this is four <coughs> multipliers, but this one is not scheduled. So here, that's nice. There's only two multipliers, multiplications per clock cycle, two here. And it means that time multiplexing, I'm going to reuse those multipliers, right? I have um, two multipliers, and first I do this multiplication, then this one, this one, this one. Same for the others. And I'm putting, in this case, two additions in one clock cycle. And why is that? <coughs> because adders are way faster than multipliers. So we, we can do multiple additions in one clock cycle if we have a multiplier. So that's scheduling. You decide the clock cycle for each operation. Optimization can be you want minimum execution time, so as fast as possible, minimum hardware was, or something in between. So this is a schedule for two multipliers and two others. Allocation means how much pieces of hardware do I need for each type, for, um, of each type. So if I have two, three clock cycles, I need a finite state machine, I'm gonna, uh, it's time multiplexing, I'm going to reuse, uh, reuse some of these hardware modules. That's called allocation. So in this case, I have two multipliers and two adders. And then the last, I'm not going to answer that. The last one is, I have, if I have two multipliers and four multiplications, then I have to decide which multiplication goes on which multiplier. That's the assignment job, right? And so in this piece of hardware, I decided to have a green multiplier and a blue multiplier. And so multiplication one goes on green, two also goes on green, three goes on blue, and four goes on blue. Same for the other others. And how do you assign these color codes? You do that to minimize access conflicts. Every unit can only be used in one clock cycle. You cannot do two multiplications on the same multiplier in the same clock cycle. It's not going to work. And you want to minimize interconnect bus multiplexers so there is a reason why I connect the green one to the left in both, in both assignments, because if this would be to the right, I'm going to get way more multiplexers in my hardware. And so the synthesis tool is going to do that for you, which then results in um, this kind of uh, circuit. Eh? So this is scheduled, allocated, and assigned. And then you get hardware like this. I have two multipliers. They go to flip-flops. I have two adders. 
and you see critical path from one flip-flop to the other one, so those are in the same cycle, maybe you have some feedback, you have some multiplexers, and you get a finite state machine that goes with this piece of hardware. This is now a very dedicated, call it domain-specific coprocessor, which is going to execute this little program um, in three clock cycles. And the tools will do this for you. Now you can imagine that telling now the tool that I want this thing to be secure, then first of all you have to specify it. Does it mean constant time? Does it what does it mean, right? Side channel secure and so on. So that's the register transfer level. Um, all of this, if you have software scheduling, you don't have the allocation assignment. Maybe you do have if you have multi-core. Um, and so you can tell these tools, what is the optimization goal? Do I need real time? Do I need minimum hardware? And you can say, no, I want security, but you're not going to have that button, so it's not going to work. Um, and then, then you have a gate level description. So then I go one level down, and then I actually go to the, um, the gate level or logic level. And at the logic level, you actually introduce now delays. And delays meaning that all these gates that I have are going to have some <coughs> delay. And the delays can be different. Uh, it's typically specified from low to high, high to low. So if the output of a gate, the CMOS transistor, so there's going to be some capacitance, and this is going to be high to low, low to high, is going to have different values. Now, these individual cells, um, they are specified in, in tables in standard cell libraries. So you don't have to do this yourself. You get that from a company, right? So someone like TSMC, UMC, uh, Samsung, Intel, they all have their own standard cell libraries. And so what is the tool going to do then? You had your little layout. And what it's going to do is actually it's going to decide for each of your gates what oh, the circuit, what's the logic depth, what cells are sitting in my library? Do I have the cells in my library to implement this? This is still my same multiplexer exam. Eh? So I have an inverter. I have an end or invert cell. Output buffer, flip-flop, and maybe this thing goes back. And then you do a layout. The layout is going to generate parasitic timing. And then maybe the, the thing what no, might not work or might fit your clock cycle or your sample constraints, and you might have to start over if it's too slow. Um, and how do we do that? We do that with standard cell libraries. And we get those standard cell libraries from companies, and this is typically what you get. And you say, OK, this is a NOR gate with three inputs. This is the generic VHDL description. You could also have a table lookup type of description. And then these are the things you will not get, but they're inside. In the sense that you get the transistor level description of this circuit. This is typically company proprietary, so you don't know how they implement it. You will certainly not get the layout, but you probably will get this. You get, you, you get the black box with the inputs and the outputs on the layouts. And the, and the power and the ground. So VDD is power, VSS is ground. And then you get input outputs all of that corresponding to the little thing. The tool will then, uh, so you, we had all our cells, the tool will then take all these cells, do synthesis and put them in, row, in rows. And this is an extremely old picture, at least 20 years old, because it only has two levels of metal. And in, if you have two levels of metal, you can still see something. So all these cells are put together like Lego, uh, you connect them, and then the tool will wire, that's the blue thing is, between the cells. Um, and that's what typically standard cell plays and route tool will do. And um, if I would show you a picture of these days with seven or eight layers of metal, you wouldn't see anything. You would only see the top level metals, right? So I'm only showing you an old picture where you can see. If I zoom in, this is what you see. You see all the individual cells. Uh, purple is um, a level 2 metal in this case, blue is level 1, and all the other things are the contents of the cells. So what you see here is contents of cells. So these days you will not see contents of cells. You only see black boxes 
and wires. And the black boxes will be filled in at the company site because that's intellectual property of the company. TSMC will not give you the insights of. And so that's one other thing when you want to do design for security, you get a description of the cell, a certain behavior. It's going to tell you, oh, this is an end gate. You have to believe me. The NAND gate has this kind of delay. It has this input and output capacitances, and it has this amount of power. But also average, they're not going to tell you exactly how. Um, Danilo has been trying to use those libraries to get good power estimates so that he can use it for side channel power estimation and design them. Extremely tough. And then this is uh, how these things are made. Um, I'm going to skip a few slides because I have way too many slides. I was going to show this how to do that an old design for this or AES. And I was going to show a couple of AES variations, but that's also too light. But I want to show you maybe um, how we can, how can we try to marry security by design and design for security. Um, and there is many attempts. There is, um, um, and one of them is at the gate level is, is the things say, uh, uh, to, to provide you with circuit level technologies that give you DPA resistance. Um, there's two main techniques, the randomization and masking. You had a really nice lecture of uh, Lauren on how to do this in detail. Um, I'm going to talk about an older technology, cannot be mathematically proven. Uh, the nice thing about this, it's compatible with standard cell based uh, design. So you can kind of, yeah. so we want layouts and this is a hiding effect with, that doesn't create side channel information while you can do that by switching constant load capacitance and you switching actually once every clock cycle. You want, um, because CMOS by itself will show what it's doing, right? It's dynamic. Um, so maybe I'll skip this slide because I'm going to short in time. So, we try to marry this whole standard-based approach with an approach um, that gives you security by design, by coding the cells in a technology called wave dynamic differential logic. Basically, if you have inputs, um, value zero, it was coded in zero one, um, input value one, it's coded as one zero, you get pre-charge, uh, value which is zero zero and a forbidden state which is one one. So every individual operation, an end operation, an OR, an OR, an XOR, and so on, you code it in this kind of recode it in this kind of tables and make it differential. The nice thing, and then that's because of its CMOS, is that um, every clock cycle you have exactly the same amount of transitions and you, if you design your libraries well enough you're going to get the same amount of power consumption so you can build your cells together this is a differential XOR gate this is a differential and or invert gate and then you can build them together i'm first going to skip that but then you see layouts like this now something that also, Lauren was pointing out is that you have a certain model or certain assumption of this behavior. In this case, we also want to make sure that my differential gates see the same amount of capacitances because um, I didn't explain that, but why do I need to say amount of capacitances? Because that influences what you see in the power consumption. Now, differential gates want to see the <coughs> same amount of capacitances. You can do that by um, making, see, making them seeing the same parallel routes. This is easier done in, in ASIC than on FPGA, but there are tricks to do that. Um, I'm not going to explain this. This is a typical layout, how fat cells are replaced by differential cells. But the picture that I wanted to show is that it's a way to introduce design um, security by design in existing tools. 
Um, this is the logic flow which I try to explain to you. The first one is that you write VHDL. Then you do this logic synthesis tool where the tool decides how many gates you need for your throughput, for your, uh, for your throughput, for your power consumption and so on. And then you trick it actually the tool and say, okay, I do want instead of my regular cells, I want cells that don't show what they're doing. And we call that cell substitution. And then you do all the backend place and route uh, integrated in the tool. So you can try to integrate it. And I think at that time it worked. Maybe we'll have to redo it with all the process variation. There's also something you saw today. Um, redo it in, in very low or small technologies because of process variations, but that's a way of integrating. And then you see a layout like this. You see all the cells, the differential cells, so they're back to back, but you also pay a price. And the price is, of course, that your circuits are going to be way bigger. So this is an insecure AES, uh, not resistant to side channel attacks, uh, easy to break with DPA, I think like 2,000 samples. This is a secure version, probably up to 1 million uh, samples, which these days is not considered secure anymore. So that brought me to almost the light slide, is that actually we want now to predict side channel resistance at design time, uh, so security by design, um, at all levels, at my behavioral level, at my gate level and at my lay layout level. So I, how can I do that? Because at this level, or actually after fabrication, I can do good evaluation, but can I already predict how much side channel leakage I'm gonna have when I'm still at this top level. And this is something that, um, with and without physical, this is something that um, Vanilla tries to do, is actually, is there, correlation between simulations at this top level. At this top level, the only thing I can measure is simple toggles. At this level, I can have a little bit more information, but as you know, these library models don't have too much uh, input. And that's what you see here. The toggle levels are the black ones. The blue one is prime time, and prime time gives you a little bit more information. The red one is actually transistor level simulations at H spice level. Now at H spice, you can show anything. The problem with H spice is you can simulate 500 transistors and then you run out. So you cannot do this for huge complex processor, things like that. <coughs> Which brings me at my last slide. I was asked to talk to you about security by design. I think this is an unsolved problem. It requires a design pyramid for security. It requires models, models which are not well available to us. It requires metrics, how do you measure it in these tools. It requires de design tools which are taking security into account. It requires simulation, it requires verification, and I think this is only the beginning of this. And I want to end with the same statement uh, as was seen before. The security is only as strong as the weakest link. And that's my last slide. Thank you.